call me Oscar Progresso. Or, for that matter, call me anything you want, as Oscar Progresso is not my name. Nor are Baby Supine, Euclid Cherry, Franklin Nuts, or any other aliases that now and then over the years I've been forced to adapt. No one knows my real name anymore. Though you may not be half as peculiar as I am, if you separate out your vanities and illusions, the petty titles to which you hold fast and by which you are identified, the abstract and insensible money in your accounts, your bogus theories, and your inane triumphs. What have you other than a body that, even if you are now as healthy as a roebuck, will eventually war against you until you are left with nothing but memory and regret? Was I supposed to forget what I had seen and what I had done? I attacked Berlin when Hitler was still in it. I fled from a Swiss mental institution to run away with a woman I still love, even though she is dead. And we went to the Arctic Circle and stood at the foot of the Aurora. I was once one of the richest men in the world and once a kid who worked hard and saved his money for a sugared donut and some sheet music. I fought alongside the angels high above the earth where the air is as thin as helium and defeat is an exploding sun. I have tightened my grip and narrowed my eyes, rushing toward gunfire like gravity. I have been in a great army that took years to conquer half the world. I have sailed across the ocean, rocketed into the clouds, skimmed the Hudson, and cut apart its lily pads with my propeller, and I have seen the demise of nations and new nations arise. I think that when I was blown backward from my plane and my eyes were filled with the fireball of its explosion, as many opposites met in the same place, speed and stillness, sound and silence, wind and the vacuum of the upper atmosphere, consciousness and dreaming, I may have become for just an instant an angel. That's what was written by an old American man in Parque da Ciudad in Niteroi, across the bay from Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Hey, this is Jonathan with Limitless Mindset, and this is my book review of Memoir from Ant Proof Case by Mark Helprin. Those are some passages from the book. Sorry about this quick interruption. I've got an important call to action for you. Please go watch this video and subscribe to Limitless Mindset over on one of the alt tech platforms, Rumble or Odyssey. And that is where you can catch my latest videos along with browsing my entire library of content and videos and podcasts. Over 700 pieces of edifying 
content about biohacking, nootropics, smart drugs, anti-aging, life hacking, about my pragmatic, full-spectrum, anti-fragility philosophy. If you value health freedom, I urge you to get outside of your digital comfort zone just a little and vote for the kind of future you want with your attention. Join and use the pro free speech social media platforms. I have the links below this video to where you can connect with me on those platforms. I do pay more attention to the comments that I get on those. Please don't procrastinate any further in taking back your freedom and your privacy from big tech. Don't even pause this video. Just pick one of the alt tech platforms. I think that Odyssey is the best. It's kind, it's a lot like YouTube. It's as good as YouTube as a video platform, but there's no annoying ads interrupting the videos. So just pick one of those. Again, I've got them linked below and join it in another tab or window while we get back to what you clicked on. And I have the pleasure today of reviewing this book with my wife. Hey, babe. Hey, John. So you read this book with me. You read all 515 pages of this book because I told you that if you wanted to understand me, then this book is something that you might want to read. So thank you for taking the time to, to do that with me. Yes, John, this is why I read it. And also you said that it was probably your favorite book of all time. Perhaps, perhaps. Having read it three times now, I read it when I was a teenager. I found it on my parents' bookshelf. And then I read it again about seven or eight years ago when I lived in Medellin, Colombia. And then we read it now, just recently, and having been through it these three times and having thought about it uh, quite a bit the last couple of days as I was organizing this article, I can see how the book has influenced me in subtle ways, both positively and negatively. So we're going to get into all that here. And we should probably issue uh, spoiler alerts at this point is if you have not read the book, I would urge you to go ahead and read the book. If you're looking for a fiction book that you're really going to enjoy, that is going to make you laugh, uh, that's going to perhaps make you cry, that's going to uh, leave you speechless, with a uh, beautiful prose. I recommend this book pretty highly. It is pretty close to being my favorite title that that I've that I've read. So, what did you think of the book? Okay, so he recommends the book to probably mostly guys, right, John? Mm, I guess it's kind of a book for guys. Yeah. Uh, I doubt that very many women would enjoy that. Because it's full of things that guys are into. Like guns. Like flying in an airplane. Like wars. Like... Um, Seduction. Stealing gold. Stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. So it didn't appeal that much to you? I have mixed feelings about that book. Okay, 
Okay. I can say that this is the worst book I've ever read in my life because I have certainly read... The worst book. No, it's not. Okay, no, it's no, no, not no, no, the no. worst book. No, 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 no. You've read a lot of books, like, like well, yeah. over, almost a, over 500, I'm sure, a yeah. thousand books yeah. eventually yeah. 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 you'll yeah. have under yeah. your belt. Yeah. So this is very far away from the worst book I've ever read in my life. But it has no potential to ever become my favorite one either, or at least in my top 10, unfortunately. Even though it has some redeeming features like um, being written very beautifully, especially when it comes to scenes from New York City, where the character is from, the main character. And this is also seen in another book by Helprin, which is Winter's Tale. Winter's Tale is also set in New York City. Right. And there's also really, really beautiful scenes in it. Maybe For, for example, on New York, he writes, quote, I remember the city then as a colossal essay in black and white, with more shades of gray than the world now knows. Yeah, yeah. The book is full of very beautiful, fascinating descriptions of New York. And not just New York. For, for example, when he's writing about uh, making love to his second wife, he says... I have loved Marlise solely according to the tropical paradigm, which means that in our sweat field, screaming, grasping, semi-hallucinatory dalliance, we have achieved a certain intimacy. Our flesh and fluids have been pressed, mixed, or imbibed with such vigor that at times we have been unsure which one of us was or was not the other. I loved this woman with every atom of my body and each ether of my soul. Yes, and later on he says that he loved her just for her beauty, which in my opinion is no love at all. This is simply attraction. Sure, sure. This is yeah. not love. Yeah. He doesn't love her for the woman that she is. He loves her for her looks. In my opinion, this is very shallow. I'm sorry. Mm, yes, very shallow and, and human. Yeah, well, if you love someone for their looks, you don't love them. Yeah, that's that's a bit that's a bit shallow, isn't it? Yes, and your feelings are more likely to fade away as soon as the looks fade away. Mm -hmm. And he writes, let's see, on love, he says, sometimes love is taken away unjustly, but not until the very end do you stop believing. And then it is very bitter. It is bitter because somewhere within you, the perfect standard still lives. The pure expectation against which failure and betrayal are contrasted like the dark shadows on a moonlit road. To keep your love alive, you must be willing to be obstinate and irrational and true to fashion your entire life as a construct, a metaphor, a fiction, a device for the exercise of faith. Well, he speaks very beautifully on love, even though he's never experienced it, in my opinion. I think he's been maybe in love with the idea of love itself. Oh, yeah, okay. Okay. He has this romantic idea of the perfect love, and he's been in love with it all along. But he never loved any of the women he dated, married, or slept with. And he was never a father. 
No. He never he never reproduced. And a lot of people would say that you don't really discover love, you don't really love unless you're a parent. That that's the the purest form of love. Yes, but he considers himself a father to the child of his second wife who she conceived. Okay, she conceived that child during their marriage. With an acrobat. Yes, with an acrobat. A random Brazilian acrobat, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, And our character, our main character, was totally okay with with it. So, I'm going to entitle this review Delusions of Grandeur and Grandiloquence. Because it's a quintessentially grand eloquent book. It's the the language is 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 strikingly uh, beautiful in it. But upon the third reading, I can see now how it's the uh, memoir of a deeply delusional man that is that that has some. That, that is uh, a man of uh, tremendous conviction, but not really a man that sticks with his convictions. He's a, he's a, an unprincipled, or he's, he's a man of fake principles. Yeah, I agree with you. So, however, this book, as I said in that uh, three hour, was it a, th- no, two hour, two hour plus podcast that I did introducing myself that I recorded uh, in this very room with you. That next- was a, lo- a long time ago and you were a very different person. That's right. That's right. But I said then how this book had, had uh, changed me some, how it had kind of inspired some of my direction in life. And I've got a few passages from the book here is he says i went free i escaped i contradicted laws disappointed expectations and defied balances in breaking the rules i broke other things too including the veils of falsehood that cover the truth like thunderclouds were the world perfect it would always be wrong to trespass. But as the world is not perfect, sometimes one must. And when you do, you live, you break free, you fly. I have always been decisive. Indeed, part of the reason my life has been as it has been is that I have looked to God rather than man for the limits of action. And this is, yeah, that attitude of the guy. And it's definitely something that I picked up even from a pretty young age when I was about 14 or so. When, when I read the book, is, it was one of the things that kind of set me on a path of being, of being uh, largely, in a lot of ways, a real nonconformist and individualist in being a person that wanted to uh, break the rules and do things my own way and rebel uh, rebel some against the rules of society. And I think this is, in general, uh, a pretty good a pretty good way to live. I think that um, at this point, I suppose, I believe in trying to evaluate the rules of society, the rules that are imposed upon us, whether they are, you know, really hard legal rules or whether they are kind of societal expectations. I believe at this point not in breaking rules arbitrarily, arbitrarily but in trying to have a empirical view on the rules that society imposes upon us, of trying to be intellectually rigorous in looking at if the rules 
are things that are rational at things that are actually benefit us uh, individually or collectively. And I think uh, this has generally been a very kind of positive um, outlook that I have had. Um, but I can definitely say when I was when I was younger, this probably this this resulted in some things in me making some bad decisions in me uh, being immoral, um, in me doing some foolish things was that I had, uh, a drive to break rules because the rules existed as opposed to being kind of, as opposed to being more, uh, philosophical about, uh, my approach to, you know, what, how, how my behavior would conform with, um, what you're supposed to do. Okay. I can see that. Okay. I was also going to, I also want to share a life hack, which is that when you read a book like this that has really beautiful language in it, that has like really great vocabulary in it, as you're reading the book, you're probably going to read it using a Kindle device or using some type of e-reader, is you want to make highlights and when you come across really cool language, you want to highlight it in orange. And I use orange because that's the color for the Super Memo app, which is the flashcard app that I like to use to memorize pieces of information, vocabulary, uh, foreign language vocabulary. And this is something that as you pick up uh, cool phrases from well-written books, you commit that into memory using this app and then you can use that vocabulary in your own writing or you can uh, just use it to seem a bit smarter at cocktail parties. And so, for example, there was a phrase I liked, invidious triumph. And invidious triumph means a win that rouses ill will, animosity, or resentment. That's hmm. kind of an interesting idea, right? Mm-hmm. So we could say, for example, babe, and in, we could say that the the public health uh, dictators here in Bulgaria mm -hmm. they impose the green pass thing because they want to have a bit more power. They want to, you know, make more money for the pharmaceutical companies. So it's a short term win for the public, the public health tyrants. It's a short term win for them, but in the long term, it rouses ill will, animosity and resentment amongst the population. So it's a, it's an invidious triumph. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a, a cool piece of vocabulary, right? Yeah, I agree. Okay. So, like I said in the in 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 the book, and this is kind of the subtext of the book is upon your first upon first reading of the book. When I read the book as a young man and then or as a teenager and then when I read it again, as a young man, you base the basic takeaway as a man, or especially as a young man reading the book, is you're like, this Oscar guy, or whatever his name is, like, he's a badass. Like, he's an amazing, epic man. He's a, a fighter pilot. He goes to war. He becomes a billionaire. He be, um, he he robs a, a bank of a tremendous amount of gold. He has this. Uh, he he has these uh, these amazing rants that he goes on to. He uh, he stands up against. He stands up against uh, what he thinks is wrong with the world, which is coffee. This is kind of your first, upon first or even second reading of this book, you like he, you, you can, you might understand how he comes across as an aspirational character, as like 
someone that you'd that you'd want to be like. Uh no. Right? No, I wouldn't even like to meet a person like him. Okay, but you you might understand. You might understand how how that's how I took it. When you were 14, yes. And and then again, I think when I was about 27. Um, but the you had different values, John. Mm-hmm. But on on second reading of the book, as as uh, or uh, upon further investigation of the book, you see how the guy is really he's really kind of crazy and del- and and delusional, and we see how he uh, holds values in very very high esteem, but then he doesn't. He he really doesn't follow through on the on the values very much in in the grand scope of his life. Um, the values don't really uh, they don't really manifest. For example, I'll read the final paragraph of the book, and the final paragraph of the book is actually a uh, pretty baffling um, taken in context. Quote: All this time. My heart has told me nothing but to love and protect. The message has been strong through the twists and turns, and it has never varied. To protect and to protect and to protect. I was born to protect the ones I love, and may God continue to give me ways to protect and serve them, even though they are gone. And I remember when I first read the book, I, I actually jumped ahead to the very last page and I read the last page before I had finished the book. And I said, I thought to myself, that, that, that paragraph doesn't have that much to do with, with the guy. Like his, his, his values don't really seem, his, yeah, his values are not really to protect. I, I don't see him doing, doing much protecting at all. No. In the book. Nor nor do you see him really doing much much serving. He he seems to be a real self serving kind of guy. You know? Yeah. He decides to rob the bank for uh, really for self serving kinds of reasons. And that's that's kind of the major inflection point of his life is he's this uh, banker at some uh, monolithic Manhattan institution of high finance. And then he decides that he's going to uh, rob the bank of billions of dollars worth of gold bullion. And he, he gives kind of, he gives kind of some flimsy, some flimsy reasons for having, for having robbed the for having robbed the bank but what we actually see in the book is that he is he is separated from his first wife constance mm-hmm. the billion billionaires and he loves her so much that he cheats on her with the first female that he sees available which which is by the way one of the funnier parts of the book yeah right? she works at a pizza place and yes i i do recall you giggling at that at that section alone so people people will have to people people will have to to read that section to to enjoy it um but we see that he and he gives some he gives some critiques of uh, of, of uh, capitalism. He gives some critiques, some some shallow critiques of capitalism as his justification for robbing the bank. But he decides to rob the bank after he has fallen out of favor at the bank. He doesn't decide to rob the bank when he's got the corner office as a privileged executive at the bank. He he decides to rob the bank really in revenge, right? Yeah. And so this is interesting. A quote on, again, his justification. I decided then on the terrace of my room at the Hassler as Roman owls hooted. Hoot, 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 hoot at the shooting stars, that I was going to rob 
Stillman and Chase because it was there, because this was the right thing to do, because it would bring a ray of sunshine into my life, because virtue was its own reward, because ars gratia artis, and because excelsior timidus protectat. And this is interesting. I did some Googling of these Latin phrases here because he's, he's saying ultimately these two Latin phrases are, are uh, summing up why he decides to rob the bank. And so ars gratia artis means art for art's sake. So I'm not really sure what that has to do with robbing a bank. Is he saying that that robbing the bank is going to become is is an art, and so he's going to do it just for the hell of it? I believe that's the idea. Okay, and then the second phrase, excelsior timidus protectat, and this means nothing. Actually, this is in fact just a Latin phrase that Mark Helprin made up. Excelsior actually means up, means ascending. You're right. You're right about that. And timidus means uh, timid, but then protectat means nothing. It's a fake Latin word that Mark Helprin invented. Mm -hmm. I checked two um, Latin two Latin dictionaries online, and of course, I I also Googled it with a double quotation marks, and it's a fake word. <laughs> it's just a word that uh, he invented. And I, I'm wondering if I'm the first reader to to figure that out. I'm wondering if any I'm wondering if anyone else ever figured that out about this book. And so this uh, gets at I, I think this is the hint that this character is just full of bullshit. That he's he's making up Latin words and making up Latin phrases to justify his uh, revenge instinct to get back at the bank. He is. So I can see uh, with me, I can see how it affected me positively. Again, the way I think it affected me positively is it gave me a bit of a, a bit of a rebellious spirit and in general, in general, the universe rewards rule breakers more than it r rewards rule followers. So I can see that that was beneficial to me. But I can see that a lot of my life up until the point that we got married, I can see that I was not really a principled person. I, I certainly like held some principles in high esteem, like a ver various libertarian kinds of principles um, and various kind of, uh, oh, kind of traditional, uh, traditional uh, Western or Christian types of principles. I held them in high esteem, but in a lot of ways, I didn't live my life consistent with those. Um, you can, for example, see my my excellent article that I did and podcast that was entitled I Forgot What D'Artagnan Taught Me and Got My Dick Burned by a Laser. And in that article, I get more detailed about how I have betrayed my principles and have uh, paid the cost for it. And so I can see how the book may have influenced me negatively in that regard, but I would probably say that on balance, it influenced me in a positive way because it kind of set me on a path of being a person that was uh, a bit more individualistic and being a person that pursued adventure. So I don't think that I would go back in time and, you know, go and steal the book away from 14-year-old Jonathan Roseland. Okay, yeah, sure. So let's see. So, okay, so one of the things that's funny about the book, one of the things that, one of the ways that I did not adopt 
the values of the book is that in the book, he has a mortal enemy. Coffee. That's And right. And you love coffee, you always have. That's right. That's But right. But he has a good reason. At least I can say that his reason to hate coffee to such an extent is validated. completely validated and justified. Yeah, you just have to read the book. It's heart-wrenching. Okay. The so, reason is heart-wrenching. So, so let me explain his, the case against coffee because it's, it's kind of hilarious. So he says... I went on defending the light against the overwhelming darkness. Caffeine, Constance, is similar to genetic code. Is it? Yes. And then he names off a bunch of uh, chemicals of, that, that consist of caffeine. As you know, DNA replicates itself, but caffeine interrupts this holy process like a typhoon blasting all the punts on the river Isis and explodes the genetic system. Caffeine replaces adenosine at the receptor sites of the neurons, causing the neurons themselves to fire at untenable rates. This usurpation and its unbridled effect its attack upon the balance of nature, its liberation of the fire and the light that serve as the battering ram of the soul is a sin of the highest order. It causes sterility in insects, I declared. What about humans? Constance asked. Humans are not insects. That's correct. I told her, in fact, to be honest, in making sperm more motile, it actually promotes human fertility. Is this fair? Why not? Only the dullard sperm, the caffeine-using sperm, the addiction-prone sperm, sperm get, use, get to use outboard motors, the virtuous sperm that won't accept The outboard motors don't get to the egg. And since the outboard motors, so to speak, are left outside the wall of the egg, what is it that gets in? A weakling, a dullard, a dunce, a non-swimmer, a tailless basket case, a slovenly jerk that got upstream upstream because it had an Evan Rood strapped to its back. Spangler missed this point entirely in understanding what ails the West. So he, in the book, yeah, he is totally against coffee. He's trying to convince people the, entri the entire book Uh, futilely to stop drinking, to stop drinking coffee, and it it never works <laughs> whatsoever. Well, he needs to be forgiven here because he hates coffee because he's been traumatized. Yes, yes, and let's severely let, traumatized. Let, let's leave that as a spoiler for people to read the book. I guess the takeaway you can say from that is that he he never does anything to deal with that trauma no and the the nature of trauma is of course that if you don't uh, address it effectively then that trauma just uh, becomes a part of your personality and then that trauma just ends up uh, perpetuating people call it the blind photocopier Of, of history. And so it's kind of a tragic, a tragic tale in that respect. Yeah. Okay. He writes, on being thought crazy. So there's, like I said, my takeaway from the book upon third reading. I think this is the final time <laughs> I'm going to read. I'm going to read this, Mine too. this book. Like I said, the takeaway is that the guy has uh, all sorts of delusions, delusions of grammar, of grandeur, and uh, delusions of uh, delusions of morality and of uh, being principled as as well. But he had, at different points throughout the book, he admits that he's that he's crazy. For example, she thought I was crazy, but so do many people. 
They simply do not know what it is like to touch heaven and be thrown back. The world looks very different after such an encounter. And to be frank, I know that many of the people who think I am crazy are in fact crazy themselves. And that I am not the least bit crazy. <laughs> Well, he's not principled either. He has no he has no values that he thinks he does. And then this line made me laugh. According to Marlies, according to his wife, women's 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 love you because women's loves crazy people. <laughs> that part, that part mm -hmm. should be enshrined in the 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 red pill tome. Of facts about women. <laughs> so women love only crazy people, Joan? Women's loves crazy peoples. Uh-huh. As Marlies as as Marlies as as Marlies says. And he also writes about his first wife. He says, I had a wife with the grace and physique of a professional dancer, the perpetual youth of a koala bear. <laughs> like you. Like you. <gasps> Go, go, go look up pictures of my wife on my social media and you can, you can, you know, take a gander at her koala bear like perpetual youth uh. Uh, about Constance. She had naturally blazing blonde hair, a doctorate in economics and the wonderfully entrancing qualities that flowed from having several billion dollars. And he can't handle the seven, the several billion dollars. And once again, John, he loves her so much that he cheats on her and he doesn't give a... He doesn't give a shit. He doesn't seem it. to have the idea there. Okay, the idea there, this is the idea there, is that she betrays him because she starts drinking coffee. And so then he feels justified in betraying her. Uh-huh. But, but this is a major contradiction because he talks so much about love. He talks so much about, about how he loves her so much. He should have been able to get over that, right? Yes, exactly. Or he should have, he, he should have set expectations, like... In the relationship. Like boundaries. He should have set boundaries. He, sh he, sh he should have set some expectations in the relationship. But he never did. Um, and we can also kind of see with the two of them, they don't have, they don't have children. No. Even though they are the most comfortable people in New York, right? Yeah. They, they don't have children. And so their union, it ends up being... It ends up being for naught. Um, they both succumb to they both succumb to the the carnal temptations because they don't they don't have anything really anything really. But she succumbs to coffee and he succumbs to some some hoe in a co in a in a pizzeria. Yes, yes. That exactly. That that uh. That uh, yeah, he succumbs to the earliest opportunity that that presents itself yeah his love is is uh ultimately very true right or it's um yeah it's shallow he says on promises nothing is as beautiful as a promise right after it's made mm -hmm. yeah he doesn't believe in uh actually keeping promises and, okay, so I have to admit, similar to the character in this book, I have something that is, well, it's sort of like his relationship to coffee, is he, uh, my thing is music, is in his, okay, in the Oscar Prim Primavera world, He's, he's constantly baffled at how seduced the entire world is and how obsessed the entire world is by, by coffee. And for me, it's, it's music. 
is all all my life people have uh, I obviously I've been to plenty of concerts I've listened to plenty of music I've known plenty of musicians your own mother Constance is a beautiful musician that's right you know, well I'll take your word I'll take your word for it because music to me has just always been pretty noise I'm like God, Uh, there's another mp3 there's another cd of pretty noise uh, it 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 sounds pretty but i'd rather listen to a podcast or an audiobook frankly well that's okay but you don't hate music as much as oscar hates coffee no no i no i don't but i don't have so a it's not the same. i don't have a traumatic uh, childhood experience with music so oh well If we don't count that your mom uh, played the piano to you and sang to you quite a bit while you were inside of her. Yeah, apparently it, it just it didn't rub off. It wasn't <laughs> it wasn't for me. Sorry, mom. On music, he writes, Dis on music, despite its connection to dance, Music is nonetheless the emblem of immobility. For when it is really great, it seizes time and holds it still in an invisible grip. And let's see. So uh, in the book, he talks a lot about being a, uh, a P-51 fighter pilot. In World War Two, I skipped all those parts. You did not like the the war parts. No. So yeah, if you if if you're a bit of a World War Two aficionado, aviation aficionado, you're really gonna love the book. But if that is uh, as boring to you as socks, then maybe you'll feel the same way about it as uh, as my wife did. Mm -hmm. Here. He writes, though, for example, alone over the Mediterranean, lost in skies of cloudless blue, as free as an angel, I could hear deep notes rising from 1,500 horses running, and I would sing in time and in counterpoint. I danced after a fashion strapped into a parachute strapped into my seat burdened with all kinds of things strapped to me i moved the plane in wasteful unauthorized dangerous beautiful maneuvers in banks that lifted the load to the point of almost breaking us apart in dives that sought the hypnotic blue of the sea and in climbs which i thought that if i kept the throttle out, I might come near the precincts of God. Everyone knows that young fighter pilots are arrogant, but few understand that this arrogance is merely a misguided effort to achieve the requisite state for flying an airplane in combat. To do that and survive, you must indeed have something that might seem to a boy to be arrogance. But what you need is not arrogance. It is rather enthrallment and surrender to speed. Oh, I love these. Those kind of those kind of sections of the book are what I found most rousing in it. So I've got a number of other notes here. Like, for example, he says, on war, peace, and luxury, I had arranged to live out my days in peaceful luxury, which seemed rather odd in that for most of my life, I had detested luxury and never known peace, which is why war, though insane, seemed to me to have been the true state of things. And the years in which war did not rage, a grand illusion. Okay, is there anything else about the book that you liked? That I liked? Yes. Okay, 
Two things I liked about the book only. One was the beautiful phrase that Helprin could turn. And the other one were the jokes sprinkled throughout it. Yeah, the the jokes the jokes and witticisms are are quite good. Yes, I enjoyed those. I can tell that they they were they were pretty good. But oh. overall, John, I think I told you, but now I'm telling your listeners, the book to me was utterly boring. Because Helprin must have become a poet, in my opinion. Because beautifully written prose is not interestingly or engrossingly written prose. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think that he's a good storyteller. He unfortunately sucks at storytelling. It's boring. It's chaotic. The whole book is all over the place. He starts somewhere at some point, then he cuts off, and then he starts at some uh, different point, then he cuts off and gets back to the first one. Uh, to me, this is distracting, chaotic, and not preferable. Okay, so the non-linearity of the story. Not just that. It's just boring. Utterly boring to me. Okay, okay. How many stars? Two. Two stars. For the, uh, for the, the, beautiful, the beautiful writing? Yeah, maybe two and a half. Okay, okay. Well, thanks. Thanks for reading it. <laughs> Yeah, John, for I, it a I shot. did it for you. And also, I didn't write the idea. I didn't like the idea that he was such a cuck. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that's something I picked up. This, I think it was maybe the second reading of the book. I picked that up that he was, that he was a cuck. Like in, well, again, and this is kind of just his inconsistency, is that in a lot of ways, well, in a lot of parts of the book, he's a real manly man. Like he's into he's he's into he's into fitness. He uh, he 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 fights people. He goes to war. He murders uh, a few people. Uh, at least three people, yeah. right? Um, so in in some ways, he's a real manly man. But then when it comes to his Brazilian wife, he. He, he can't keep her, he can't keep her, you know, he can't keep her in line. And she ends up cucking him. That, that part. He doesn't mind. That's the more baffling part. And you then know, he doesn't mind at all that she sleeps around. And yeah, he adopts the, ch yeah, he adopts the child as his own. So he has kind of a, he has kind of a misdirected provider instinct is instead of instead of being uh instead of being a provider to Constance instead of like just having a normal family with a woman who's a billionaires he instead has his ridiculous fallout with her over something rather petty and then uh escapes to Brazil and then becomes a cuck so yeah, he's kind of he's uh, uh, inconsistent as a masculine as a masculine figure. Yes, he is, and he doesn't find her a single mom. Uh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. She yeah, she cheats on him. She has an affair. She cheats on him, and he's completely fine adopting uh, the child. And. The I think the idea is that it's just it's just her beauty. Her beauty is just so intoxicating that he lets the cheating fly. Her beauty, unfortunately, is pretty temporary. Uh, let's see. In the book, in the book, it says that she ages gracefully. That's the that or that's the idea in the book, at least. Is he's he says both of his wives uh, age very age very gracefully um which in and of itself is i mean in and of itself that's kind of a romantic 
that's kind of a delusional romantic uh notion um beauty beauty tends to fade over time that's kind of just one of the inevitable things in life is that unless uh people are doing a tremendous amount of like anti-aging beauty hacks uh your beauty is going to fade over time so well is it okay for him to put up with her cheating on him and sleeping around with different men just because she's beautiful. No, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. Exactly. I do wonder, this is one thing I didn't, this is one thing I did wonder about. Maybe the second time I read the book, I wondered why, yeah, why he puts up with that, why he accepts that. And upon the third reading, I think it's just because he's, just because he's, unprincipled in things just because he's 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 just a an inconsistent kind of guy so i think i gave it five stars originally because i because i love the book because it uh i found it the i mean the language itself uh as you say the language itself deserves uh, a handful of stars that's true i would give the language most of the language especially the language used to describe new york city i would give that six stars okay okay the I think the story I think the story is actually pretty good. I like the story is nonlinear. It jumps back and forth from the beginning of his life to being an old man in Brazil to World War II to being a pompous uh, privileged banker. The story jumps around a bit, but there is a there is a grand story arc that goes from the traumatic experience of his childhood into the decision to rob the bank. There is there is a grand story arc from from start to finish in that in that in that respect. So I think I, I think I'd have to give it I think I'd have to this is what I would say as a novel as a book I would probably give it I would probably give it Five stars or four stars. The reason I may deduct a star is actually because of what I discovered yesterday doing the Googling and the searching is discovering that there's invented words in the book, like the word pertaflexions. <laughs> and this is this is another bullshit made up word. Uh, and, the, and the Latin word is a made up bullshit word that doesn't mean anything. So that that makes me wonder... If if that's because Mark Helprin, the author, was just lazy and he just was making, I mean, if he made, if there's two things that he made up that I found just doing a little bit of Google searching, then that means there's probably a lot of other made up stuff in the book. So if that's the case, then I would give it like four stars. Um, but if it's a thing where there's made up words to uh, just express the uh, yeah the insanity and the delusion of the main character. Um, then that's kind of, then that's like very then that's amazing subtlety, especially considering that the book was written before the internet was really popular. The fact that he put made up words into the book as a thing that an obsessive reader could find which would hint at the underlying insanity of the character that's that's extremely subtle i would say that's kind of that's deserving of five stars however but the uh, this is a personal growth podcast so the the major criticism that i would say is yeah maybe the book deserves five stars maybe this maybe as fiction it deserves five stars but as a uh, as inspirational material as as something with personal growth benefit um yeah the big thing that we have both pointed out repeatedly here is that the the character is totally unprincipled and that of course that of course is um is not good so that's kind of so so at this point i kind of have mixed feelings about 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 the book it certainly it had some kind of it had some kind of influence on me but it's uh yeah i guess it's 
uh, unfortunate that I didn't uh, at a younger age have the uh, have the insight to see that the book is kind of a tragic tale of a pompous, uh, grand, eloquent man that is um, that is that is that is brought down because of a lack of um, his action and behavior being consistent with his his principles. Yeah, and once again, how did it impact you negatively? Oh, because I wasn't... I Well, I've always been a person that held principles in pretty high esteem. Mm -hmm. You know, being... Like, I've been doing the limitless mind th mindset thing for 10 or 11 years now. Um, and even before that, I was, I was a person that was always... Yeah, I was always interested. I was always interested in, in, in a lot of principles. Um, but I can see in the, the way that I've shifted in the past couple of years, or uh, in, and especially in the past year, I can see how my, uh, my lack of loyalty to principle, I can see how that was uh, a negative thing in, in my life in a lot of ways. Like I can see how uh, years, uh, years and years and years and years ago, I had this insane business partner, Patrick, uh, that I've also done podcasts about, who was this uh, total psychopath, who was a uh, deeply, deeply unethical person in every, in almost every single way. And uh, having him as a business partner was not good for me. As and a best friend. As a, as a best friend, as a roommate, that was not good for me. And previous, previous to having him as a business partner, I had... I had read all sorts of books about business. I had I had read uh, different. I read books about ethics. I'd read a lot of the Bible. You know, I had a foundation for being real principled in business. But then I uh, I started to abandon those principles. I got away from those principles for uh, at least several years. I don't know, five years, maybe, maybe longer, maybe less, kind of hard to say. Um, ultimately, ultimately I did break up that business partnership. I, I, uh, uh, walked away from that business partnership. Um, so I did eventually kind of get back to principles, but I can see if I had been more principled to to begin with, I would have I would have passed on that particular business partnership and all of the insanity and craziness and and abuse and dysfunction and uh, alcoholism that came with it. Yeah, yeah, maybe, John. So those are our thoughts on this book. I do, uh, yeah, I think I do recommend it to those of you out there. I think it's, uh, yeah, as far as uh, fiction books go, it's uh, one that you will, uh, I think uh, people will enjoy it if they're a bit more like me. I think they'll, I think they'll enjoy it, which is probably a lot of our listeners. And do drop me a line or a message or an email or comment wherever you're listening to this and uh, if you do read the book let us know your thoughts on it also yeah I just don't recommend it to women okay not not recommended to women no by Mrs. Roseland <laughs> well that's my personal outlook sure sure fair enough fair enough I look forward to a continued conversation with you